newborn screening is, and um, a bit of background about it first. Newborn screening has been around for over 50 years in the U.S., and babies are screened shortly after birth, usually within 24 to 48 hours. Um, there's uh, more than one in 300 newborns have a condition that's detectable through newborn screening, and newborn screening is a three-part test. It's a hearing screen, um, it's pulse oximetry to look at oxygen content in the baby's blood, and it's also what we traditionally think of as newborn screening as a collection of blood as a spot um, on a card. So newborn screening is a public state health service that reaches nearly all of the four million babies that are born in the US each year. And ensures that those babies are screened for serious health conditions at their birth. And for babies with those conditions, it allows doctors to start treatment of them before some of the harmful effects take place. It began in the 1960s when Robert Guthrie developed a blood test that could look for PKU. And currently, there's screening tests available for more than 60 diseases. Um, each state decides what they want to screen for, so there's variability across each state's newborn screening panel, and that's determined by the state's public health department. The Federal Advisory Committee for Health uh, and Health Department for Newborns and Children, or sorry, I'm sorry, the Advisory Committee for Heritable Disorders in Newborns and Children recommends what to screen for, and that's on a panel called the RUSP, which is the Recommended Uniform Screening Panel. And that was established in 2003. In 2006, they initially recommended 29 conditions, and they've also established this process to add new conditions. And so since 2006, there have been five additional conditions added. Once a condition is added to the rest, the states have their own choice whether to implement screening for that condition or not. So they can have more or fewer things than are on the rest. And there's a variable amount of time that each state takes to implement. For example, um, SCID was added in 2010, and only two-thirds of states were screening by 2015. So in that five-year period, we only got two-thirds of the states on board there. So it's a slow process, and it requires active advocacy to get these conditions added at the state level. There are three parts to the newborn screening, as I said, and it's performed 24 to 48 hours after birth. It doesn't confirm that a baby has a condition, but parents are notified immediately and follow-up diagnostic testing is initiated. Well, every baby born in the U.S. is screened unless a parent actively decides to opt out of screening for religious reasons. This is a map, it may be a bit hard for you to read, um, of screening of core disorders by state. So you can see the states in the darker red colors are screening for more, the states in the light colors are screening for fewer conditions. So we know that there's a need for newborn screening in SMA, and we know that early identification and treatment is important. You can see here, this is work from Kathy Soboda and Richard Finkel showing that there's severe loss of motor neurons within the first three months of life, and there can be a loss of up to 90% of motor units within six months. And you can see that graph on your right and on the left is a graph showing decline in motor function. There's also a significant diagnostic delay in SMA. And you can see here, the green is the age of onset of symptoms, and then the blue would be when a diagnosis was given. So you can see for a type one, it's about a four or so month lag between when the baby started having symptoms and when they actually got a diagnosis. So we have a lot of clinical trial data that also support early intervention. This is from the Spinraza studies, and we're looking at high knee motor function. So you can see in the blue, we have our largest improvement in motor function in those babies that were in the nurture trial, which as you all know is the pre-symptomatic trial. And you can see if we compare those babies to um, the Endear trial, which is in the lighter blue, you can see the more robust improvement in motor function. We also have data from the Avexis 101 trials showing that earlier intervention again produces a better improvement in motor function. This is looking at motor function by CHOP and TENT. You can see that those babies that were dosed sooner and, that, um, and so they were less symptomatic and had a higher initial CHOP and TENT score responded better to treatment. 
And so this, all this information and the event of um, getting the spin Roswell approval led us to nominate SMA to the RUS, which again is that federal panel of diseases that are screened for. And we submitted that application in late February of this year. So the RUS contains three sections of its nomination form. So there's the first section, which is information about SMA and what treatments are available. The second is our evidence-based information. So that's the clinical trial data and the other animal model data that we have that support early intervention. And the last section is references and letters of support. So there's a process that happens once you submit a, a nomination. It first goes to the nomination and prioritization work group. Um, and, the, and thankfully, um, our nomination was, was moved out of that work group unanimously. So now we are in this third bullet point, which is the condition review work group. And it will continue, hopefully, to move through these various work groups until we have a final decision. Once in that review work group, the uh, reauthorization of the Newborn Screening Saves Live Act gives that committee nine months to make a decision. Uh, we did submit SMA to the RUSP in 2008. However, it was rejected at that prioritization work group because there was no state pilot and, when, of course, there was no approved drug. So when looking at whether to add conditions to the rest, they look for strong natural history data, they look for approved treatment, which we now have with Spinraza, they look for evidence that pre-symptomatic treatment is more effective, and they look for adequate pilot screening from state public health labs. And there's a variety of factors that must be met from those screenings. They want a reliable diagnostic test for SMA that can be used broadly. Um, and currently, our most widely validated SMA test is to Intron 7, but that has some high false positive rates, so there's a new test being developed to eliminate those false positives. So at the federal level, we have several advocacy efforts going on. We are engaging in grassroots efforts. We're holding in-person meetings with congressional offices. We're submitting written testimony. We also have the Newborn Screening Coalition, which is coordinated by Cure SMA. And that coalition together is also holding meetings with congressional appropriators and supporters. We're urging congressional support of increased newborn screening funding, and we're developing newborn screening champions. So those are people that can really advocate um, on the federal level for newborn screening for SMA. We're also participating in the Newborn Screening Stakeholder Coalition, and it also has several efforts on the federal level to advocate for newborn screening. Well, I talked a little bit about the need for pilot screens um, to add a condition to the RUSP. And so the big pilot for SMA was done in Taiwan at the National Taiwan University Hospital. And it started in November of 2014. And this information was updated as of December of 2016. And that screen, a little over 120,000 babies. And they used an assay that looks at intron 7 of SMN1. However, they did get 15 screen positive cases to be confirmed. Um, of those, eight were false positives. Um, and so the CDC and Perkin Elmer in um, collaboration with Wisconsin are working on a new test to eliminate those false positives. There's also been some pilot screens in the US. The New York State Lab um, has run a two-year newborn screening pilot. Um, they've had one positive infant identified, and that baby entered the nurture trial. The Wisconsin State Lab is currently validating a new Exxon 7 assay on 40,000 de-identified dried blood spots. So that's a retrospective study where they're looking at previously collected dried blood spots from um, babies. The New England Newborn Screening Advisory Committee approved an SMA newborn screening pilot in Massachusetts on, um, in December of 2015. Um, they have not announced publicly when, they'll start date, when a start date will be yet. However, they um, hope to start relatively soon. And North Carolina has obtained funding for newborn screening pilot to begin in 2018. And Missouri is in the process, which you'll hear about, um, momentarily in the process of passing legislation for newborn screening for SMA um, that will hopefully be passed by the end or be passed shortly and then implemented um, in the future. 
There's also a California law that newborn screening must be implemented within two years of respedition. Um, and a similar law, this slide hasn't been updated, but a similar law has now been passed in Florida. So as I said, it can take a while once a condition is added for the rest to get states to start screening. So SCID, as I mentioned earlier, was added in 2010, and we only have 33 states screening at the end of 2015, so you can see that um, here on this map. Another example, ALD, was added to the rest in 2016, and so those states in green are those testing. So we are seeing only four states so far that are testing. There's other states that are working on it, but there's only four so far. So um, state level advocacy, again, is very important. We've made some funding requests to support federal newborn screening programs. And the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC's Newborn Screening Quality Assurance Program, that program works with states to enhance and maintain the quality and accuracy of newborn screening results, which of course is very important. So in fiscal year 2018, we've um, requested 29.8 million, which is an increase of 20 million over current funding levels for that program. Um, there's also HRSA, which helps states to improve and expand their newborn screening programs and supports local, regional, and national education about newborn screening, and we also made an appropriations request there. And so all that to say the federal RUSP is great, but state advocacy is very, very important. And with that, I'll turn it over to Megan Lentz, who will talk to you a little bit more about that. All right, thanks, Jackie. Um, what I'm gonna start with is going through the materials and the toolkit that you all received when you came in. Um, it looks, actually, it looks something like this. If you didn't receive that when you came in, we've got some staff members near the back, just kind of wave your hand at them and they'll come forward and give you a copy of that. Um, so let me start. I'm actually just gonna walk you through page by page. I think um, one thing to keep in mind as we go through all of this, the challenge for me in presenting the, today, the challenge for us in putting together these materials, and I think the challenge for all of us going forward is as you heard Jackie allude to, there are 50 states and no two states treat newborn screening in exactly the same way. Um, so it's difficult to come here and say, here are the five steps to get newborn screening implemented in every single state or, you know, the three steps, even better than five. Um, so what we've tried to focus on here is some broader principles, some multi-purpose resources, um, tools that we think are gonna be useful in a number of states, no matter what process the state goes through. Um, having said that, certainly once you go through this information, you're gonna be thinking, great, how exactly does this work in my state or what does my state do? And so you're gonna hear me say this email address about 20 times before I finish, but advocacy at curesma.org is the best place to sort of direct your initial questions. And when we get a little bit further on, I'll also give you other ways to get a hold of us, but that's gonna kind of be, I think, your best first door in. So if you start here on the first two pages of the toolkit, you've just got a little bit of an introduction and you also have some background information on SMA. I mean, I think a lot of the background information on SMA for folks in this room is going to be old hat. It's gonna be information that you already know. Um, but as we thought about this project and sort of the magnitude of what we're trying to do, we realized we needed as many advocates as possible. And so there may be folks who are um, interested in newborn screening or child health, but don't have a good background in SMA. And we wanted to ensure that this resource is something that they could use as well. Um, so that's kind of the reason that we've put a little bit of information about SMA in there as well. Um, going forward to the next two pages, you've got some information here about federal advocacy. And I just wanna give a couple important um, caveats about this information. So as you've heard again from Jackie, um, so I won't you know, go over it again, state advocacy is really the key to effective implementation. And that's what we're asking all of you to really focus on today. Uh, having said that, again, as Jackie explained very well, there are some federal rules and regulations and laws and some funding requests 
that do impact um, how effective states are able to be. And so we wanted to have this information in here because there will be times when your advocacy work may cross into the federal level. Um, Jackie mentioned that we're trying to develop federal champions for newborn screening. Some of you may have even received outreach from us here at Cure SMA saying, contact your federal representative or your, fed or your you know, senator at the federal level and encourage them to be a champion. So that sort of advocacy may sort of cross between state and federal. The other is that this federal legislative process, so I'll go, go to back to the old schoolhouse rock song that we all remember, but if you haven't committed it to memory, um, this graphic gives you a nice rundown of it. But many states use a process for passing legislation that is very similar to um, how the federal government works. So not only does this give you a little bit of background for those times when we do need to cross into federal advocacy, but it also gives you a little bit of good background that might help um, as you work through your particular state. Going forward to the next pages, this gets into more of the, again, similarities and differences between state and federal, but also the similarities and differences among each of the states. Um, and I, so I think this here, this is a section that's good for me to let you know. We want you to take this home, look it over. Um, it, has a nice map, it really gets into how the different states work. But again, we know it's not going to be quite the level of detail that in many cases you're gonna to need to move forward into your state. Um, so we've given you a primer here, but again, for the second time, advocacy at curesma.org um, is a good place to get a hold. And so once you've reviewed this information and you think, great, I I'm ready for the next step or tell me more about what, what my state's legislature, how it works and what that means for me, let us know and we're happy to help with that as well. Um, I wanna spend a little bit of extra time. This is another uh, set of pages that goes through um, some of the similarities and differences among each of the states. And you've got this big purple box that says at the top of page eight and there's actually quite a bit of important information in page, uh, or in this purple box. So you've heard me say a couple times already that states have different processes. Again, we're not able to go through all 50 different processes, but this gives you sort of three big buckets of how states generally work. Um, so this is a good way to kind of start breaking it down. Some states work through legislative means, so you have to pass a bill that institutes newborn screening for SMA. Um, you're gonna hear an example from Missouri that works in this particular way. Um, some states take action administratively, so somebody like, say, the governor is able to make that decision. Um, other states are a little more tied to the RUSP, and so this is a good thing and a bad thing. Um, in many cases, we have to, in these states, wait for the RUSP decision, but then once the RUSP decision is issued, those states have a specific limit of time within which they have to implement newborn screening. Um, so three different approaches. Again, this breaks them down, but I think the important thing to keep in mind is that in many cases, how you're going to advocate, how you're gonna to try to put together your personal story with the facts about newborn screening, um, how you're gonna approach those, uh, those legislators is going to be very similar. Um, if you're in a legislative state, you might be targeting that to a state senator or state representative. If you're in an administrative state, you may be targeting that towards your governor. Um, but it's going to be a lot of the similar principles throughout, and that's really what we're trying to focus on with these toolkits. Um, this also makes a very important point here about state newborn screening committees. So many states have a committee. They realize that their senators or their governor is not an expert in newborn screening, which is fine. They're probably experts in other things. Um, but they have a panel of experts that gathers on a regular basis, evaluates some of things like the data that Jackie was just referring to, and makes a recommendation. And the great thing about these panels is that most of them have opportunities for public testimony. Um, so if your state has a newborn screening committee, when they meet, you are able to come forward and offer public testimony in support of screening for SMA. And again, I think the resources here are going to uh, really help you as you sort of craft a testimony because a lot of the things you're gonna talk about there are similar to what you would talk about in, say, a meeting with your governor. Um, the remainder of this page is just really practical. So, okay, I, wa I wanna set up a meeting. How do I go about that? Uh, what do I do after the meeting? What If I get to the meeting and they say, 
wow, I'm, I'm so moved by your story, but I have to tell you this is just not a priority for our state. What do you do then? Versus if you go there and they say, I'm so moved by this, what do I do next? How do you go forward then? Um, so that's what these uh, particular pages get into. I'm actually gonna skip the very last two pages of your toolkit. I'm gonna come back to them at the end. Um, but real quick, in the toolkit, you also received three different handouts. I'm just gonna run through those really quick. Um, so you have this first, it's called Talking Points for Policymakers. And similar to how I mentioned, those last two pages of the toolkit are very practical in nature. This is also extremely practical. Um, it's pretty much a step-by-step -step roadmap to putting together an effective advocacy pitch as it relates to newborn screening. So it walks you through in bullet point form some of the key items that you're gonna wanna cover. It calls out places where you can amplify those points by sharing a personal story. Um, it gives you ideas for what you can do next. And so really as you're starting your advocacy journey, I think this is something that's gonna be incredibly helpful. Um, certainly we don't want you to, to feel constrained by this, to feel you can only say the words that are on this piece of paper, but I think particularly for those of you who don't have experience advocating for something like this, this is a great place to start in terms of how do I even begin to make the case for newborn screening? The second uh, two handouts are a little bit different. So this is actually, it looks like two handouts up here on the screen, but if you pick it up, you'll see it's actually one handout, two sides. Um, so the front side gives, again, a little more base information about SMA, and then the back side talks about the importance of newborn screening and so digests a lot of the things that Jackie talked about, about how we know earlier treatment is more effective, but we also know that many families experience long diagnostic delays. And so if you combine those two facts, it's difficult to give treatment in the most optimal time unless we have newborn screening. And so we envision this having sort of two uses. One is this is all great information, and so you wanna have an easy way to keep it on hand, use this handout. And so it's a good, easy resource in terms of that. But I think even more important, we really envision this being a leave behind. So you go to meet with a governor or a state senator, you tell them your story, and then at the end you are able to say, Here's a piece of paper that gives you a lot more information on what I've just talked about. I would love to leave this with you and then you know, call you back in a couple weeks and see if we can talk more. Um, that, that's what this is great for. Perhaps you're sending a letter and you want to include something with that letter that again gives a lot more of the background information that's important. That's what this sort of handout is for. And then the last handout is actually very similar in that we envision it being both a resource for you and something that you can hand out or enclose in a letter as you're making, um, you know, as you're advocating for newborn screening. So all of you have the Florida state fact sheet. We are here in Florida, um, but we know you all don't live in Florida. So you've been given Florida as an example. Certainly for those of you who do not live here in Florida, I will talk a little bit later about how you can get the fact sheet for your particular state. Um, but this is something that's gonna be really important. You know, uh, legislators, newborn screening committees, all of these folks are certainly very interested in how SMA impacts society as a whole, but they're particularly interested in how it impacts their state because that's where they have influence, that's where they're able to make a difference. Um, so a, a lot of this information is more broad, you've got the types of SMA on the back, but you've also got some very specific information in terms of how many people in your state are we estimate are living with SMA and how many babies would be born each year and thus you know, positively impacted by newborn screening efforts. Um, so at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Representative Becky Ruth. So many of you, we've got some great information here and you're thinking, okay, this all sounds fantastic, but how does this work in real life? Like, how can we actually move this forward? Um, and so we have a great example, um, as I think Kenneth and Jackie both mentioned, there is legislation, legislation in Missouri 
um, that would institute newborn screening for SMA. And so this has been passed by the House and the Senate. And it's currently awaiting the governor's signature. And this would make Missouri the first state to screen for SMA, which obviously would be um, a huge milestone for our community. Um, so we are fortunate to have Representative Ruth, who is the sponsor of that legislation here today. And she's going to talk to us a little bit about how she's gone through this process, but also give us some ideas and trip tricks and tips that we can use in other states. Um, so let me give you a little bit more background. Representative Becky Ruth represents part of Jefferson County and the Missouri House of Representatives. She is serving her second term in office. She is the vice chair of the House Transportation Committee and serves on the Children and Families Committee and the Special Committee on Innovation and Technology. Representative Ruth is vice president of her legislative class and last session served as secretary of the Women Legislators of Missouri. In addition to her legislative duties, Representative Ruth currently works as a realtor with Remax Best Choice in Festus. She is also a retired teacher and taught at Festus High School. Representative Ruth is a 1982 graduate of Festus High School and received her BA with teacher certification from College of the Ozarks in 1986. She currently serves as a state director for the Jefferson County Board of Realtors, is a member of the Jefferson County Parents as Teachers Advisory Board and the Jefferson County Growth Association. She has received the Missouri State Teachers Association Friend of Education Award, the State Legislative Award from the Missouri YMCA for Youth Development, Healthy Living and Social Responsibility, the Friend of Agriculture Award from the Missouri Farm Bureau and the REMAX Best Choice Award for Humanitarian humanitarianism and community involvement. Representative Ruth currently resides in Festus with her husband, Don, and they have four children and four grandchildren. So Becky, I'll turn it over to you. Good morning, everybody. Everybody have fun last night? Was that not awesome for QSMA Biogen to uh, sponsor that night at Disney? Fireworks were fantastic. So as Megan said, I am a state representative from Missouri, and I hope everybody can see me because I'd rather come down here and I'd rather talk to you rather than at you. So that way also if you have questions as we go along that it'll be easier for me to come to you and, and get those questions and answer them. As Megan said earlier, we're legislators. We're not experts on everything. We are citizen legislators. We come from different walks of life. So many legislators have no clue of what newborn screening is. Even people out in the public, when you talk about newborn screening and you say, well, it's just a small heel prick, they want to know how much blood is really taken from that baby. Does it hurt the baby? What goes on? Is this something we really need to be doing? So just the general public, as well as legislators, have no clue of what newborn screening is all about. They all want to know that their child is going to be OK or if there's something wrong, but they really don't understand the process involved. So every baby in Missouri is, is screened for over 70 diseases. So that small little hill prick we know can absolutely save a life. Once we know early enough so that whatever the therapy is or treatment can be started, it can potentially save the life and make a difference in the life of a child, as you all are probably very aware of. So in Missouri, I'm going to tell you just a little bit more about myself. My, my journey began back in 2008 as just a grandma. I was a first-time grandmother, so excited. My daughter had a little boy. His name was Brady. He was born in April of 2008. Looked wonderful, healthy, smiling, happy. A few months went by and things just didn't seem right. He was really, really irritable all the time. He was having all kinds of issues in terms of keeping food down, just didn't seem right, kept going back to the doctor, kept trying different tests. Well, let's see if it's this. Maybe it's just acid reflux. Kept getting worse. At one point, they thought he was having seizures. She took him to one hospital. 
She was there for two days. The hospital released her despite her tears and crying and saying, please don't send us home. There's something wrong with my son. I know there is. Please don't send us home. And they sent us home with physical therapy. By that Sunday, Brady got much worse. And it was apparent he was having seizures. There was something going on. He was projectile vomiting. She said, that's it. She drove him to St. Louis, took him to another hospital where they said, we promise you won't leave here without a diagnosis. Three weeks later, unfortunately, we got that diagnosis of Crab A disease. For us, it was like a punch in the, in the gut. We were told there was nothing that could be done. The disease had progressed too far, and it was too late for Brady. We talked to all the experts. We talked to Duke University, where Dr. Kurtzberg is an expert with Crab A, and she agreed it was already too late. He was symptomatic, and a bone tra marrow transplant wouldn't help. It wouldn't stop the progression of the disease. Brady suffered a lot because Crab A disease destroys the myelin sheath, on the which is the coating of your nerves. There were times it hurt him for us to try to pick him up. We couldn't even comfort him. My daughter said, Mom, this is ridiculous. We weren't given a chance with Brady. Had we known with newborn screening, he could have had that bone marrow transplant. So we've got to stop this from happening to any other family in our state. So we worked very hard, very diligently, and in 2009, the governor of Missouri then signed the Brady Allen Cunningham Newborn Screening Act. We gave our state about three years to kind of get their ducks in a row because let me tell you, it wasn't an easy road for us back then, especially for Crab A disease. Hardly anybody else was testing for it. New York was. Um, but there were some issues with their tests. We looked at Illinois. They had passed a similar law, but they were struggling with finances and things like that, and it was hard for the and their lab people. So it was hard for them to kind of get it in place. But we did it. Three years later, our state started testing for Crab A disease. Since that time, we've been able to save the lives of over 120 children just from that small little act. Thank you. And that's a, that's a testament to Brady, my grandson, because as you all know, he touched more lives than I could ever possibly hope to in his short time here. So, I decided, after going through this foray of newborn screening and seeing the good, the bad, the ugly, and the plain to ridiculous in politics, to run for office. Again, that was a big challenge. Made it through, and I was elected in 2014. I served on our Appropriations for Health, Mental Health, and Social Services and Health Mental Health Committee. So started working on more issues, more things. SCID was brought up in 2015. However, it didn't pass that year because we had a really dysfunctional Senate. We still have a really dysfunctional Senate, um, as, as some people know about Missouri right now. But we were able to come back and get it passed in 2016. Another legislator worked on that. I helped her with it, and we were able to get skid. So last fall, I was at a conference for Crab A in Atlanta talking to some folks, and there were a couple of SMA families, and I'm not sure if those SMA families are here at the conference or here today, but I had the chance to meet them. And we sat down and we talked, and our lab manager happened to be there as well. And we decided it was a no-brainer for Missouri to take that step and let's add SMA to our newborn screening. So that started our process in Missouri. Um, Megan talked a little bit about that schoolhouse rock video that you guys have all seen about how a bill becomes a law. And that is the watered down version. <laughs> okay, we can probably all sing that song from our memory, but it really is, at least for state legislators, it's a very watered down version. So when you go into wanting to file a bill, that's your first thing, is you've got to find a state representative or senator 
that will listen to you and be willing to file that bill. You need to find the one that's going to be the most passionate. When you're talking to your state representatives or state senators, find the one that's not going to give up. Find the one that's going to get out there and be passionate and make this their goal to get done in the legislative session. So we had to go through several committees. The bill had to be referred to committee. We had to go through several committee hearings for this. And then it had to be voted out of those committees. And from there, it had to come to the floor where we perfected it, where it had to have amendments, could have a bunch of stuff added onto it. And then we third read it and pass it. And from there, then we go to the Senate and start the whole process all over again with committee hearings, getting the committee chairman on board, getting them to pass it, sometimes just simply getting that, that committee chairman to hold a hearing on it is tough. Or if they hold the hearing on it, they could still hold the bill if they feel like they're not going to have enough votes or there's something else going on. So that's why I say it's important to find that legislator that has a passion that will make this their goal and get this done for you. So we were able to do that. We also added MPS2 to our newborn screening. We're already doing MPS1, so we're going to be screening for SMA and MPS2. It did pass successfully out of the Senate 33 to nothing, which is amazing for Missouri. And it passed 138 to, with only 10 dissenters who, 10 people that just vote no on everything, so out of the House. So it was delivered to the governor on May 22nd. The governor still has that bill. We've been wondering, is he going to sign that bill? There's three different things that could happen. The governor could sign the bill. He has until July 2014. He could just simply let the bill go on into law without signing it. If he does nothing, it still becomes law. Or he could veto it. So most of the way through, we were told that the governor, it was all good, everything was good. And then it was like, well, there may be 90% on this because it's been added on to another bill that has a lot of amendments on it. So Thursday night, I saw my governor. And I went up and I talked to my governor. He was at another bill signing. I went up to give him a handshake and instead he came in for this big hug. So I took it as an advantage and I said, Governor, I sure hope you're going to sign Senate Bill 50. And he said, Senate Bill 50? What, Senate, what, what's Senate Bill 50? I said, newborn screening. Oh, yeah, yeah, we've got that. So we have a verbal commitment right now from our governor. We'll see what happens. So you see House Bill 66 up there. Sometimes you've got to find other avenues. House Bill 66 was my original bill. That's what we had in there. It made it all the way through the House, all the way through the Senate. It was supposed to be brought up on the Senate floor for debate. As I said, our Senate's been very dysfunctional. Unfortunately, we didn't get House Bill 66 through the Senate. It stalled out because we had some senators that were filibustering some other things, and they could never get to House Bill 66 as a result of it. Luckily, I was able to add it on as an amendment to Senate Bill 50. So that's how we moved from House Bill 66 to Senate Bill 50. So what is in our language? Our language requires, mandates, our state lab screen all newborns for SMA and MPS2. Now that is, a parent can say, I don't want my child screened, so they can opt out of it. But it, those babies that get that little blood spot taken all of them in Missouri will be screened. In Missouri, we have a birth rate of about 80 to 85,000 live births per year. We all know that SMA has an occurrence rate of somewhere around 1 in 10,000 or so. So we could be talking about 8 to 10 children. By adding MPS2 on this also, we're talking another 3 to 4. So anywhere up towards 15 children, almost a kindergarten class per year that we can make sure are screened for these two diseases. When looking at legislation, one of the things that legislators always look at, of course, is the fiscal impact behind that legislation. How much is this going to cost? Unfortunately, it is a reality. We have a balanced budget in the state of Missouri, thank goodness. 
but we have to stay within those budgets. And that pie is only so big, so they have to look at how much money do we have this year and who's getting that money. So we have to fight very, very hard for that money. So I looked at our newborn screening fund. We have it as non-general revenue and our Missouri Public Health Fund. We have newborn screening fees in Missouri. It's about $80. That's the family's pay or insurance pays, Medicaid pays, whatever the case may be. And that money goes into a special fund in Missouri. That fund was very healthy th to the tune of about $4 million. The fiscal note for Missouri to start screening for these two diseases is $454,000. So we have funds already that are there. Just have to convince the legislature that we need to use them for that. And I also found out that there are grants that are available. So in the language of the bill, we decided to add that the department, because they weren't so sure they wanted to apply for these grants, so we're mandating that they apply for any available grants that there are. However, we did give them the caveat that they don't have to accept the terms of the grants, because we didn't want to tie their hands too much. If it's, if it's going to require them to do something that wouldn't be good or wouldn't be ethical, then we need to give them that opt out and give them the ability to negotiate the terms of the grants. And we also allow the department to raise the newborn screening fee if necessary. And it could be at 80 to 85,000 live births, you guys can do the maths. If you raise it $5, we're gonna have more than enough money to pay for it. So making sure that the funding is there, that there is a funding source, makes legislation go much more smoothly. Go ahead. This is a picture of my grandson, Brady. This was um, shortly after he was diagnosed with, with crab aid disease. And he's the reason why I'm here. He's the reason why Missouri's going to start screening for SMA. He's the reason why we started screening for crab A and for other leukodystrophies. So I thought it was important that I throw a picture up of him. He's in my heart every single day. He passed away 10 days before his first birthday in 2009. He was actually there for one of the newborn um, screening hearings for crab A. My daughter was able to bring him up to the Capitol. Um, that really made an impact as well. Go ahead. So where do you start? You want to start advocating for this, and we want other states to come on board. And it can be a little complex to try to figure out, because some of you that have never had to do this before, how do you do this? Where do you start? Research, 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 research. That's how I started. You need to look at several things. What does your state currently screen for? How many diseases? You can find all of this on the state's websites on their, their uh, newborn screening lab websites. Our state, Missouri, screens for over 70 d diseases. How do they fund newborn screening in your state? Is it general revenue? Is it non-general revenue? Where is the funding source? How many live births are there in your state? Because again, legislators think in terms of dollar signs. As I said, find a state rep, find a state senator, that you believe is going to be passionate and carry this cross with you. State health lab. Talk to the folks at your state health lab. Make that contact. When we first started with our newborn screening for Crab A, I can tell you our, our state health lab wasn't on board. They weren't sure they wanted to do this. As a matter of fact, I still remember, which uh, Dr. Vogt isn't here. I spent a lot of time on the folk phone with Dr. Bob Vogt from the CDC, and he told me, you know, in one of these conference calls, you were actually referred to as a bulldog. I laughed, and I took that compliment, and I wear it as a badge. <laughs> Our newborn screening lab said, you know, they just weren't sure about this. They weren't sure they could do it. I told them to get on board the train, we were doing this with or without them, and it sure would be a whole lot easier if we had you on board in the beginning. 
So go to your state health lab, make friends with them, talk to them, talk to the director, get your state health lab on board. It'll make the process a much, much easier. In Missouri, we have a genetics advisory committee. Um, Megan talked about that a little bit earlier, that some states do have that advisory committee. Find out who's on that committee. It's all public knowledge. It's all on the websites. Go to them and talk to them. Talk to the chair of that advisory committee. Missouri's advisory committee 100% was on board with screening for SMA and MPS2, thanks to Dr. Ann Connolly, who, who was on that board, talked to them and said, we want to do this. She did a whole presentation on SMA. And they were on board and they told our lab, yes, we want to do this. So we had the power of the state advisory committee. Any other groups that you know of? in your area. Some of your chapter SMAs, things like that, they're gonna be great resources and they're gonna help you through this. What are the benefits for screening SMA? Your state legislators are going to ask that. Why should we be doing this test? You families sitting right there, have your children sitting in front of you. That's your benefits for screening SMA. Always put a face to the dollar sign. Make them see that for every dollar amount they're talking about, that there is a face behind that dollar amount. Don't let them forget that there are people behind those dollar signs. Because sometimes as state legislators, we can get wrapped up in our budget way too much, and we forget about the people that it's impacting. So put a face to that dollar sign. Make sure you tell them why you need the legislation. If it's not there, it's not going to happen. Now, I heard Megan say there are some states that the governor can automatically say we're going to do this, and that's great. So then that's where you're going to need to start is, is with your governor's people and get him doing that. I believe probably the majority of the states, you're going to need legislation for it. Make this personal. When you're talking about costs, Talk about what it is for palliative care. Talk about the long-term costs that are associated with having a child with SMA versus doing the newborn screening, which once they get it set up is just pennies on the dollar. And the fact that you're going to be able to make life better for these children, they're going to be able to meet their milestones, and they're going to be able to live a healthy, happy life. The most important thing that I can say is that you all, all of you in this room, are much, much more powerful than what you ever, ever realize. You are more powerful than you realize because you are the advocates. You are their constituents. You can have Megan go and talk to them. You could have Jackie. You could have Kate from Biogen go and talk to them. That doesn't mean anything to them. Why? Most of them are going to get elected again. They need your vote. They care more about you, or they should, because you're their constituent. And they're going to listen to you more than they're going to listen to somebody like me or anyone else. So you've got to be the advocate, and you have to show them that your voice matters. So you are more powerful than what you ever realize or what you ever think. You can do this. I started out as just a grandma. Had no clue where I was going to take me into politics. Had no idea of that in mind at the time. But I did. I was determined we weren't going to let this happen. So you've got to go in there with that mindset. And you may say, you know what, I'm just dealing with enough right now. I don't know how I can do this. I've got everything else going on, my family to take care of, how do I do this? Get some friends. Several of you, get some friends to help you, help you do the research. Go and talk to those state reps. Let them see that it's more than one person that cares about it. And it doesn't even have to be a family that's affected with SMA that's helping you. Get some girlfriends out there. Guys, you're out there playing golf with your buddies. Get them to come with you and talk to your state representative. Get them to write letters. Use social media. So what are the next steps then? 
once you can get a state representative or a state senator to agree, get the legislation filed, then get the media involved. You've got to be willing to tell your story. Tell your story to as many media outlets as you possibly can. They want to hear from you. They care. These are stories that they really do care about. Talk to your local newspapers. Talk to your, your local TV stations. Get on social media and use your sphere of influence. Social media is very powerful right now. Just a little tweet can make a difference, good or bad. Ask Donald Trump about that one. So use your sphere of influence, talk to all of your friends, put it out there on social media. We used Facebook quite a bit when we were doing Brady's Law, asking people to call their state representatives in their area. You're reaching more people, you're reaching different areas of your state. So it's not just one person making those phone calls. Get prepared to testify in front of committees. Now that may be a little much for some of you guys. And that's why I say get prepared. I was so nervous the first time I sat down to testify in front of this committee. I'm sitting there thinking, oh my goodness, these are powerful people in front of me. What am I going to say? What are they going to ask me? Guess what, guys? They're just people. They're just people, and you hold more power than they do. So just prepare to, to testify. Get determined and stay involved. The road can sometimes be tough, but you've got to have that fortitude to follow it all the way through. Because if you don't show that, they, that you care, then they're not going to care. One of the biggest things that I can say is don't take no for an answer. If you go to a state representative or a state senator and say, here's what I want to do in our state, and they say, oh, I've already got like five pieces of legislation I'm filing. I'm not sure that I can do this. This is a lot of time. Or I don't know enough about the subject. Fine. Move on. Find that next person. But don't let them tell you no. Stay at it. Perseverance is key here, and don't ever, ever take no for an answer. And then the last step, get the bill, bill passed and start working on the governor to sign it. I put my contact information up here. I'll leave it up here for just a few minutes. If any of you want to write it down, feel free to email me. I will come and help you in your state. I will talk to you. I will take you through this step by step if you need to. This is too important. I'm hoping that we see Missouri do this and then other states are going to fall into line after that. We'd love to see that cascade. I am from Missouri, but I believe passionately in your cause. I believe passionately in screening newborns for every disease that we can do something about, that we can make a change for. I testified in front of the long committee name the, on heritable disorders on the federal level. I can tell you that I actually had a doctor on that committee tell me how dare states go out and pass newborn screening on their own if it's not on our RUSP. How dare they do that? We shouldn't be testing for diseases unless there's a 100% cure. And I said right back to them, really? You tell that to any Crab A family. My grandson didn't have the opportunity, so how dare you tell me that we can't do this? So make sure that you have all of your information, you're prepared, and I will be there for you. I will make sure if you need help that you get the help that you need. So contact me, call my office, email me, whatever you need. Let's get all of our states on board to screen for SMA. Thank you. Thank you so much, Becky. I mean, not only for being here with us today, but for your leadership in this area and for really giving us a model that we can use in so many states going forward. I think this is going to be so crucial and so helpful for us as we tackle the other 49 states. 
Um, so we also had a family that was very involved with this legislation. They testified before the House and the Senate in support of this bill. Um, and we asked that family to come here today and share from their experience. And um, unfortunately, they were not able to travel, but um, the mother, Grace Grutter, was very kind to do a Skype interview with us last week. Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and just share with you a couple highlights um, of that interview. Hi, my name is Grace. I am mom to Nella, who has SMA type 1. So what motivated me to get involved was um, knowing that there's treatment available and that um, the sooner this treatment is given to any child with SMA, the better their outcomes are as far as um, their disability and you know what um, their prognosis is. So I really felt it was crucial to speak about this and to speak about SMA and to um, be involved so everybody knows so that we can get this changed for future generations so that, I say future generations, for the generation now, um, so that they won't have to hear those words of there's no cure, there's no treatment, take your child home. Um, so my involvement uh, with the process of getting Missouri legislation passed, um, it was r really not um, too hard or anything, so I don't want you to be scared by it or anything. Um, I was originally asked to write a 10 to 15 minute testimony on kind of what our life is like with SMA, um, and then present that, first of all, to um, a committee on the House of Representatives in Missouri. Um, so writing that, I just... I really kind of laid what life was what life is like out there. Um, I told them, you know, just the effects of an SMA diagnosis emotionally, financially, um, socially, just kind of everything, you know, that our life is like. And I don't typically focus on the hard part of our lives, but this is where, like, they need to hear it. They need to understand what it's really like living with um, a type 1 diagnosis. I went down to Jefferson City um, to, for that committee, and on before the way down there, um, I went down there. I looked online to see who my local House of Representatives um, representative was, <laughs> and then I also looked at who my local state senator was. And I called down there ahead of time and said, um, hey, I'm one of your constituents. I'm coming down to present on this bill. I was wondering if I could meet with you before. And... Um, the representative was out of office, he was busy, but I was able to meet with my senator. And so that was great because I went down there and they always want to hear from their constituents. They um, put priority on you. So I went down there and I met with him and I explained to him what SMA was and talked about this bill and why it was crucial for Missouri saving lives and um, how much it would be a huge uh, benefit to Missouri but to add this. And it was really great. He um, he didn't know about SMA. He you know, so it was all a very cool learning experience for him, as well. And so I was glad that he knew he knows about SMA after that. So then I went down and I, we um, presented in front of the House committee. And um, unfortunately, when we got down there, they got held up in other meetings. So when we got asked to speak, they asked if we could cut our. I think my presentation was about 12 minutes the night before and asked if we could cut it down to um, three minutes. And I was the first to talk, so that was a little scary. I think I was still over five or eight, but I tried to condense where I could. So um, that was another thing to be aware of, is that you will you may run into that and to just know what your main points are. Um, and after me, a t mother of a type 2 spoke, and then... Um, a PhD from Cure SMA spoke, and then um, a leader from Biogen. And it ended up passing through that committee unanimously, so that was great news. And then it went to the House of Representatives with everyone, passed through there, no problem. Um, and then next I was asked to come back to Jeff City and to give my testimony um, in front of the Senate Health Committee. And so I came down and did that, and it was a lot of the same thing. I kept my speech pretty much the same, um, changed a few things, that I thought of after I thought were more important and um, 
So after that, it, um, while it was sitting there, I made a point to um, reach out to my friends, reach out to my family, everybody in Missouri to say, uh, to say, can you please call your senator, your local senator, and tell them about this bill, tell them why it's important to you, tell them why it's important to Missouri, so that they heard from you. Um, and I also asked on my daughter's Facebook prayer page um, for anyone in Missouri to do that, and I know several people did call. And so you just need to make your senators aware of this bill and why it's incredibly important to your state and what it means for families in your state. Like, you know, it'll be saving lives. What I learned about being an effective advocate through this process was that you're kind of going to have to put yourself out there. Um, you're going to have to talk a lot about your personal story, and sometimes it's hard to talk about those hard things with SMA or the hard life that some of us have with SMA, and it's not comfortable telling that to strangers, but that's what um, these representatives and senators need to hear so that they're aware of how so many of us are living. Um, and also to be open to talking to new people, to researching as much as you can about the bill, and then also to talking to your um, local House of Representatives and your local Senate committee, and, um, and then talking to your friends and family and asking them to reach out to them. So it's basically a lot of talking about the bill, so being more open about it and um, willing to research and just, you know, being excited about it and talking to as many people as possible about it um, is really, I think, what helped me and what helped us get as far as we have come with this bill in Missouri. So good luck. All right. So um, as you can see, that is on YouTube, and so um, it will be available after this if any of you um, want to watch it again, or for those of you who have friends and family uh, from your area who are not here, you can let them know about that. Um, so real quick, I know we're a little short on time, but I'm just going to go through some important next steps that we're working on. Um, flipping back to those last two pages of the toolkit, the ones I skipped earlier, um, I just want to highlight this because it gives you several ways that you can get a hold of us regarding this. Again, advocacy at kiarasma.org. Hopefully you're not tired of hearing me say that just yet. Um, that's a great way to get a hold of us. We also have our general email info at kiarasma.org. Um, you can contact us through that as well. Um, kiarasma.org slash newborn screening. That will take you to a page on our website that goes not only through newborn screening, but through some of the other current advocacy priorities that we're working on. Um, a phone number is in there too, and certainly those of you um, who work regularly with your local territory representative out of the Kirasame National Office, you can reach out to them as well regarding this. Um, this is when you go to the website, this is what you're going to see. Um, so if you want to download extra copies of the toolkit or the handouts that you've got in your hands, you can do that. This is also where you can find state fact sheets. So I mentioned a little bit earlier, you've all got Florida in your hands just as a sample. We have got about a dozen state fact sheets out there right now. We are working on the remainder. We'll have those up in the next couple of weeks. But certainly, if you want to get started sooner, you go up there, you don't see your state, you can contact us, and we'll go ahead and uh, get you a copy of that fact sheet. Um, so again, kirasmay.org slash newborn screening, email, questions, comments, ideas, suggestions to request paper copies. Um, we are recording this symposium. We're going to put a copy of that out on our YouTube channel as well. Um, and we're also going to have a uh, webinar. So this symposium will just be out on YouTube for you all to review or for people who weren't able to be here um, to view at their leisure. But again, we want to combine it with a webinar. So at some point, date and time TBA, it will be uh, announced on our website. 
we'll show this recording and then we'll have a Q&A at the end. And so certainly we wanna give opportunity for folks who aren't here today to ask questions. Um, but I think the action for all of you here is consider participating in this webinar as well. As you kind of move forward, you go down the line, you're a little farther in the advocacy journey, we wanna hear like what is that next wave of questions? What new ideas, what new topics, um, what new queries are coming up, and you can certainly bring those as well. Um, so again, we're targeting July for that webinar. We'll be announcing a final date and time on our website. Um, so some good ways to get started. Um, August is SMA Awareness Month, and we are gonna be launching a program focusing on helping families make advocacy visits. So again, if you're working in the newborn screening area, it's primarily going to be a state representative, a state senator, perhaps a governor, um, but certainly we are opening this program up for those of you who have uh, you know, federal legislators, many of them are in the district in August, and so that's a great opportunity for us to work on the federal level as well. Um, so we will be announcing more information about that, giving you a list of, um, similar to what you've already gotten, of things that you can talk about, of issues that are important to cover, and sort of how to go about setting up that visit step by step. So if you're like, I'm in, get me started, I just need like step one, I think an SMA Awareness Month advocacy visit is a great place to start. Um, connect with the state level advocates from this symposium. So Becky already put her contact info up, but certainly if you weren't able to copy that down, just go ahead and shoot us an email. We're happy to put you in touch with Becky. Um, another resource that Becky did not mention, but that she has made available, is the actual legislative language from House Bill 66. And so when you get you know, really further on, you've got you know, a, maybe a state senator or a state representative who is willing to be that champion that she talked about, but says like, I don't even know kind of where to start in drafting a bill like this. We can provide you with that legislative language. It certainly is going to be have to have to be adapted by state, but it gives legislators a great starting point. Grace also mentioned that she is willing to talk to any of you if you just want to hear a little more about her experience, um, if you want to see a copy of her testimony to kind of get an idea of how another family put that together, she's willing to share that as well. Um, so email us at, at advocacy at curesma.org, and again, we're happy to put you in touch with Becky or Grace or both of them um, if you've got more questions there. Um, and then we have new advocacy tools coming later this summer. Um, so this will again be part of our website. Essentially you tell us what issue you're interested in, where you live, and we'll give you step-by-step -step instructions about who you need to contact, what you need to say, and sort of what your next steps are there. Um, and if you're signed up for our, uh, for our e-newsletter, it will also allow us to push information out to you when we know of a very specific action in your area that can be taken. Um, unfortunately, we have run short of time. Um, we'll skip the Q&A for now, but I will be hanging out in the back. Um, Jackie will be there as well. I think uh, Representative Ruth actually had to run to the airport. Um, but we'll be hanging out in the back if you wanna come find us and ask any questions. But again, I just put up kirasme.org slash newborn screening advocacy or info. This is all again in the back of your toolkit. Um, so these are the best ways to get in touch with us. We know this is gonna be a very collaborative effort moving forward, um, but we're really excited to see where it takes us. So thank you so much for your time.